Good evening, New Life Baptist Church. We're there in Hosea chapter 3, and this is the final chapter of the introduction of the book of Hosea. So, um, Hosea chapter 3, even though it's, it's quite short, it does have a lot of similar parallels to chapter 1 and chapter 2. But if you start there in verse number 1, it says, Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel. The title for the sermon this evening is The Love of the Lord. The Love of the Lord. And you know, we do have a God. God is love. We have a God that has great love and we know the extent of His love. Uh, that He sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross for our sins so we can have a way to heaven and we can spend eternity with Him for all eternity. You know, and it's an amazing uh, thought to think about how the Son of God would sacrifice Himself for sinners such as us. And so we understand uh, the love of God. But you know, when it comes to Hosea chapter 3, if you were there for chapter 2, um, I was trying to explain how there are many different views. You know, the, the, the first three chapters of Hosea, when we look at Hosea's marriage, like when we look at the teaching of Hosea, the teaching itself is not complex. The teaching itself is quite straightforward. As long as you have a decent amount of Bible knowledge, you can piece it together. But understanding what took place in Hosea's marriage, uh, you know, there are a lot of opinions out there. And the opinion that I hold here, you know, is, is quite different to the ones that you would often read about online or maybe heard uh, from pulpits in the past. But if we can just keep going there, uh, in verse number 3, it says, Who look to other gods and love the flagons of wine. Sorry, verse number 1. I think I said verse number 3. But verse number 1 there, we see that God is asking Hosea to love a woman. You know, and you're saying, well, hold on. Doesn't he already love his wife? Doesn't he already love Gomer? You know, we saw that he got married to Gomer in chapter 1. What is being asked of God, you know, this time? And we can see he's definitely telling Hosea, love this woman. All right. Now look at verse number 2. So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for an homer of barley and an half homer of barley. So what I want you to notice there is that Hosea actually has to go and purchase this woman who God told him to love. Now, let me go through the various views that exist in this relationship. You know, it might seem already unusual to you to say, hold on, Hosea, didn't you get married in chapter 1? Why are you going to go and love another woman? And so let me just express to you what people feel about this passage. Now, the first view of this passage is that Chapter 3 is about Gomer once again, you know. Uh, Hosea is taking Gomer as his wife, and so it is a retelling of chapter 1, okay. So, you know, so chapter 1, you have a very a quick overview. You know, Hosea marries this whorish woman. They have three kids. Many years go past, obviously, because they've had three kids. But then when we get to chapter 3, we see a retelling of the detail of how Hosea took Gomer as his wife. So that is definitely one view out there. It'd be similar to, say, Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. Where in Genesis chapter 1, we have a quick overview of the you know, creation. And on the sixth day, we see that God created man and woman. Uh, but then in chapter 2, we, we go into a more detailed view of what took place on the sixth day. And we see the events that took place, why God created a man, and then why he created a woman, and how he created a woman, how he created a man. So we've got a lot more detail in chapter 2 of Genesis whereas chapter 1 is more just a quick overview. So some people think that Hosea is kind of similar in that sense. Chapter 3 is a lot more detail as to how he took um, Gomer as his wife. Now, the reason I disagree with this position, number 1, verse number 1 starts by saying, Then said the Lord unto me. Okay? Then said the Lord unto me. So what they're saying is, this is after what took place in chapters 1 and chapters 2. Then the Lord said unto me, so this is something that is continuing what took, of what took place after chapter 1. Of course, in chapter 1, we saw that he, he was married and he had three children. And then in chapter 2, he's prophesying against the northern nation of Israel. And uh, chapter 3 is something that takes place after that event. So that's why I don't agree with that, because it seems to me this is not a retelling. We're not going back in time, where actually this is something that took place after chapter 1 and chapter 2. Okay? Um, the second reason I disagree with that view is in chapter, in verse number one there, it says that this woman that he is to love is yet an adulteress. 
Okay, she's an adulteress. Now, Gomer in chapter 1 is not said to be an adulteress. She's just said to be a woman of whoredoms. And so I believe that Gomer was a woman who committed fornication. Because adulteress basically means that she was married in the past. And she committed adultery. Right? And then she's getting remarried or something. Right? But in chapter 1, it doesn't point out the fact that she's an adulteress. It's just that she's a woman of whoredom. And so it's more likely that Gomer was a woman of fornication uh, who then who was unfaithful, obviously, to her married day. But, you know, I, I believe Gomer, I've got no reason to believe otherwise, that Gomer remained faithful to Hosea after they got married. So I don't agree with that view for those two reasons. Now, the second view is that this is Gomer once again, but it's not a retelling of chapter one, but this is Gomer after marriage. So the idea there is that Gomer had been been unfaithful to Hosea, she committed adultery, and, and I explain this uh, to you in chapter 2, where a lot of people get this idea that Gomer committed adultery from chapter 2 because God refers to Israel as having had committed adultery to him. And so they believe that somehow Gomer had done the same, but again, the Bible does not plainly state that. And so, you know, we're, we're kind of jumping to conclusions. Like, could you imagine if, if Gomer is actually a faithful wife? And then we have preachers behind the pulpit talking about how unfaithful she was to Hosea. She was an adulteress. You know, we, we don't have that clear teaching in the Bible. That's something that you have to kind of uh, add into the scriptures. Um, and, you know, when, when God uses, um, you know, allegories or illustrations, not everything has to be like for like. You know, the reason why uh, Hosea married a woman of whoredoms was because... Uh, you know, God, uh, as it were, as an illustration, was married to the nation of Israel. And it was as though that woman had committed adultery to God. And so Hosea was to experience something similar. But not everything that happened to Israel has to happen to Gomer. And we don't have that confirmation for us in the Bible that it took place in that way. Okay. So, yeah. So as I said, this, they, many people, some people believe that this is Gomer after marriage that she had remained, she had been unfaithful, that she had become a prostitute. This is why Hosea has to buy her. They think so. She had become a prostitute. And Hosea, even though she had been adulterous, you know, he's been commanded by God to go back to her and take her once again as your wife. And for some reason, he has to purchase her. So why do I disagree with that position? Number one, to me, it just makes no sense that Hosea has to purchase his wife. You know, it's not, it's not like God asked him to do this. Like, if you look at that, verse number one, verse number one is what God asked him to do. But verse number two just says what Hosea did. He went out and purchased this woman. Okay, if he's already his wife, there would be no need to purchase her. He would just take her. It's his wife. Okay, so having to go and purchase her like a prostitute makes no sense to me whatsoever. Okay, and again, it doesn't say that she was a prostitute here. Okay, she doesn't say she was a harlot, it just says she was an adulteress. Okay, again, you know, people that take that view are kind of adding those extra bits and pieces in that position there. Secondly, the reason um, I, I don't believe this is uh, uh, Gomer after they got married is because, again, it says that she's an adulteress. And remember, what is the righteous judgment for an adulterous woman back in those days? You know, if someone was caught to have committed adultery, they were to be brought before, you know, the judges. And if there were two or three witnesses, and one of the witnesses here is God himself, he's saying this is an adulterous woman, you know, if there were two or three witnesses, then she would be uh, put to death. She would have to face the death penalty for being an adulterous woman. So, again, if we're going by the laws of God, it doesn't make any sense to me that Hosea would have to take her once again, but rather she should be brought before judges and executed for her sin. So that doesn't align with what I understand, what, what, what clearly is taught for us in, in the Word of God as well. All right, I hope that kind of makes sense to you. Now, the reason why a lot of people do believe that it is Gomer after marriage, that she had become unfaithful and Hosea had to win her back, I think this largely comes from the dispensationalist or Zionist view where the idea is, well, Israel, you know, the physical nation of Israel, yes, they became wicked. Yes, they became an adulterous woman in the eyes of God. Yes, but even though she's gone and been an, a, an adulteress, you know, God will one day, you know, uh, love her again and they will be reunited with God. And that's why the nation of Israel still today are God's chosen people. And one day they're all going to turn to Jesus Christ, believe on Him, and they're going to have... 
uh, they're going to reign on, on this earth with Jesus Christ. Okay? So that, I, I believe that position largely comes from the Zionist dispensational view where they, where they must have a physical nation, the same physical nation of the Old Testament, somehow reappear as righteous people you know, um, in, in uh, the end times or in the millennial reign of Christ. All right, so now there's a, there's a third view. Let me share that third view with you. The third view out there is that this is a different woman to Goma. And in fact, I do believe this is a different woman from Goma, okay? But the third view says that, well, because Goma was unfaithful in chapter 2, you know, she disgraced herself as a wife, you know, God is telling Hosea, well, just go and marry another woman. You know, yes, you know, a similar woman that has a similar background where, you know, she's not necessarily, you know, she, uh, yeah, you know a woman of whoredoms, a woman of adultery. Yeah, go and marry a second woman. But my problem there is, well, is God really asking Hosea to marry and have two wives? You know, is God telling Hosea, hey, just commit a polygamy? You know, so what if your wife has cheated on you? Go and marry some other woman. Then Hosea would be married to two women. And I just, we, we, you know, again, very clearly in the word of God, God is against polygamy. So I can't support that position either, even though I do believe this is a separate woman. All right, so let me share with you what is Pastor Kevin's position. And I've come to this position only really by studying the book of Hosea to, to preach this to New Life Baptist Church. You know, um, I did have some thoughts about I had some questions, but as I read these passages over and over again and understanding God's laws, you know, it's very easy to just take a position of saying, well, this is just an exception, you know. You know, God doesn't really want you to be married to two women or God doesn't really want you to, you know, marry an adulterous woman. But this was an exceptional case just for Hosea. So we can only apply this to Hosea and not apply it to the rest of us. And look, that could be true, but I don't think we need to go there with the exception. I, I know that there are times that God asks his men to do exceptional things. And even though this, this, you know, this is unusual, I don't believe it is exceptional. You know, I believe what we see here can fit neat and tidy within the laws that God has already put in place that we can understand that are black and white in the scriptures. All right, so what is my position? Just very briefly, I believe that this is a different woman that he was asked to marry or to love, okay? I believe this woman was a widow and that when Hosea married this woman, he also was a widow at this point in time. You say, Pastor Kevin, that sounds really far-fetched. Well, let me just explain to you the reasons why. And I think once I explain it to you, it's not going to sound far-fetched. It's going to sound pretty reasonable. It's going to sound reasonable. It's going to sound accurate, okay? So first of all, if you remember chapter 1, you know, we went through it and had a look at how long Hosea was preaching to Israel. And we easily concluded that he was, you know, easily preaching at least 60 years, maybe more. 50, 60 years, even more. So, you know, even though Hosea itself is not a very large book, it does, uh, you know, the, the preaching, the, the message of that book goes on for many, many decades. And if you remember chapter 1, I already mentioned it to you, you know, Hosea marries uh, Gomer and they have three kids, okay? So just in chapter 1 alone, we have many years that take place during chapter 1. We don't know how, how much time, how many years took place between chapter 1 and chapter 2. We don't know how long the message of chapter 2 was given to Hosea, how many years he preached that. And we don't know how long between chapters 2 and chapter 3 took place. I mean, there could be several years. We could easily be looking at an entire decade going by. I'm, I'm just throwing that out there, okay? Just from chapter 1 alone, we can definitely see that many years took place. And so if many years have taken place from the time that Hosea married Gomer, I believe it is more than reasonable to say, well, it's, it's you know, we, we know that Hosea is not to marry to commit polygamy and have two wives, well, in order for him to marry a different woman than the first, that would mean that his wife had passed away. Okay, and we know that God allows remarriage if your spouse has passed away. So I believe that is, a, a, you know, very reasonable to believe that, and we see the time frame, you know, I, I don't see why that would be an impossibility. I think it's more than possible, all right? The second uh, reason... Uh, that I don't believe this is Gomer, or this is a second woman that he's marrying, is because, uh, again, in verse number 2, it says, So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver, and for an homer of barley, and a half homer of barley. And so he's gone and purchased this woman. Again, it makes no sense to me that he would have to go and repurchase his first wife. 
okay? But if he's purchasing another woman, that makes a lot more sense, okay? But it makes no sense to me that he have to purchase, you know? The fact that he has to go and purchase this woman proves that this woman was not his to begin with, okay? That she's a different woman. Again, the third reason is I don't believe God would ask Jose to have two wives. And as I said to you, so I don't believe it's an impossibility that Gomer had passed away at this point in time. And so Hosea is free to get remarried. Now let's consider this woman, even though she's not named here, let's consider this woman here. What, else, what do we know about this woman? Number one, she's a known adulteress. Okay? So the fact that uh, it says that she's an adulteress must mean that she was married when this sin took place. Otherwise, it would be fornication. Okay, so this is a woman that has been married in the past. Okay, and the Bible is saying she's a known adulteress. All right, but even though she's a known adulteress, what was the, what's the righteous judgment for adultery? The death penalty, isn't it not? It is, right? So how is it that she's still alive even though she is known to have committed adultery? Well, let's go to the book of John. Keep your finger there in Hosea. Let's go to John chapter 8 and verse number 3. Let's go to the book of John and chapter 8 and verse number 3. We're going to a very famous story of Jesus Christ here. And what we know, what we'll learn in this story is that even an adulterous person, if they do not have the witnesses to prove they've done adultery, they are not to be put to death. Okay, even though that is a righteous judgment, if the witnesses are not there, if there's not enough witnesses, okay, that are saying the same story, then she is not to be found guilty. And so in John chapter 8, verse number 3, it reads. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now look, I have no reason to say that they were lying. In fact, at the end of it, Jesus will say to this woman, go and sin no more. So it seems like she was definitely a woman that was caught in the very act of adultery. Right now, this woman gets brought before Jesus, and in verse number five, it says, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? So you can say, Yeah, the book of the laws of Moses says this woman deserves the death penalty by stoning. But what do you say, Jesus? Verse number six, and, th and they said, tempting him, this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. And though he, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. So Jesus says, yeah, you know what? It's right. We should stone her, but let it be the one that is without sin that stones her first. All right, so Jesus is very, very smart. The reason he was intelligent about this, he's upholding the law of Moses but at the same time, he recognizes they are under Roman authority. And in this time, I haven't got time to prove it right now, but uh, the Jews were not allowed to put people to death, you know, without the proper authorities by the Roman, you know, empire, which is why they had to take Jesus to, you know, um, Pilate to get the authorization to have Jesus put to death, right? But let's keep going in verse number at nine, oh, verse number eight. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So, what do we learn there? That if in the Old Testament, if a woman was found to have committed adultery and there were the accusers or the witnesses there to testify that this took place, right? Then she was to be put to death by stoning. But if there were no accusers, if there were no witnesses, even though she committed the crime, she would be let go free. Okay? And of course, you needed two or three witnesses. The only one that stood before her was Jesus. And so Jesus, you know, he's basically saying, well, you know, I, you know, I, I don't accuse you either. You know, there's, there's not enough witness there to make an accusation against this woman. And so she was let free. So what does that have to do with Hosea? Well, I'm just trying to show you that 
it does take place where a woman can have committed adultery but not have been put to death simply because there wasn't enough evidence or witnesses to uh, you know, make her guilty of that crime. But what we learn here in Hosea is this woman that Hosea was to marry or to love uh, was a woman who was, a, was an adulterous woman. Right? She, she was definitely known for that act, but she just wasn't uh, incriminated for that act. So why am I telling you that? Well, if I, I had mentioned to you that this woman would have to be a widow herself. So in her marriage, when she was married to a man, she was unfaithful to this man. She did commit adultery, but over time, for whatever reason, it seems like you know she got away with it, as it were, but her husband passes away. And this is important because if her husband was still living, Hosea would not be allowed to marry her. You know, he would be committing adultery, and again, that would be against the laws of God. All right? Now, the other thing is that we learn here in Hosea chapter 3, verse 2, again, that he had to go and purchase this woman. You say, why would he have to go and purchase this woman? Well, again, in the, the laws of the Old Testament days, that if you were to marry a woman, you would have to pay a dowry to her father. Okay, now you're saying, well, Pastor Kevin, you know, this woman was already married, and why would he have to pay a dowry, you know, for this woman? Well, I, you know, keep your finger there, and let's go to the, let's go to, uh, where can I take you to? Yeah, let's go to Leviticus 22. Go to Leviticus 22 for me. Leviticus 22. And while you're turning to, to Leviticus 22, I'm going to read to you from Deuteronomy 22. You go to Leviticus 22. I'm going to read to you from Deuteronomy 22, verse 28. And let me just read this passage to you. It says, If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife. Because he have humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. So here we see an example. If a man and a woman committed fornication, you know, he was required to marry her because she had now been defiled. But the price that he would have to pay for not, doing it, not waiting until marriage was fifty shekels of silver. Okay, so that's the dowry that he would have to pay the father, her, the, you know, the, the, the girl's father. Now, how much did Hosea have to pay? Well, there in chapter 2, it says, So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for a an homer of barley and, and a half homer of barley. So let's just put, set aside the barley for a, min, for a minute. So 50 shekels of silver, if you committed adultery and, you, you know, you had to marry that, get that woman and the father allowed it, but this woman who had already been previously married, right, um, she's no longer a virgin and she's been, you know, an adulterous woman, right, then it makes a lot more sense that Hosea would only have to pay 15 shekels, you know, a lot less than what would otherwise take place. Okay, so that kind of, you can see how that fits in. Now you say again, why would he have to pay a dowry for a woman who's already been married? Well, that's why I got you to turn to Leviticus 22. Leviticus 22 and verse number 13. Let me just show you a practice that was in this day and age. Here in Leviticus 22, verse number 13, it says, But if the priest's daughter be a widow or divorced... Now, I'm making the case that this woman that Hosea married was a widow. Okay, so, you know, if the priest's daughter be a widow or divorced and have no child and is returned unto her father's house as in her youth... She shall eat of her father's meat, but there shall no stranger eat thereof. So what do we learn there? We see that there was a practice that if a woman got married and she had no children, but her husband passed away, so she became a widow, or they got divorced, that she was to go back under her fa father's authority. And so this would make sense, that if she's back under her father's authority, even though she has a lover, we see in chapter 1, like some type of friend that loves her, that Hosea went and paid a dowry to this woman's father, not 50 shekels, not 30 shekels, but 15 shekels of silver and, and, and took her as his wife. And so, you know, what, what I, what I, you know, I, I'm going through a lot of passages here, but I'm just trying to show you, we don't have to just turn around and say, well, it's just an exceptional case. We can fit all of this within the laws that God has for us 
clearly laid out for us in the Bible. We don't have to kind of, you know, wrestle with the scriptures. You know, if we're just mindful, if we just be patient with the passage and think about the laws of God, we can see how this relationship between Hosea and this woman could take place within the laws that God has laid out for us. All right, now, let me give you another reason why I believe this is the correct interpretation and the best position to take between Hosea and this woman that he married. Well, if you remember, Hosea chapter 1 and chapter 2 begins with, you know, um, uh, the Lord, you know, looking at Israel as, a, as, a, as his wife, as it were, you know, that, but she had, be, she had been uh, unfaithful, right? She had committed spiritual whoredoms with false gods, right? So we sort of start with that idea. And of course, Gomer was, was to represent that woman. You know, when Hosea married her, Gomer was a, was a woman of whoredoms. And so Gomer, you know, illustrated the fact that uh, the northern uh, nation of Israel was, you know, a whorish nation in the eyes of God, right? But if you remember how chapter 1 and chapter 2 both ended, it ended with the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And the fact that one day Israel would be, or the people of God, I should say, would be reigning with Jesus Christ in the millennium, right? But again, you know, that physical nation was rejected by God. God said that they are not his people, that he is not their God. And so what we see is a, a, a moving away from the physical nation. And what I, you know, again, I don't want to re reiterate everything that I, that I taught, but that one day, or the, it, t this is the day actually, you know, but in, in the eyes of Hosea, there'll be a day where that physical nation would be replaced by that physical nation. That's Sorry, that, that spiritual nation. The physical nation would be replaced by the spiritual nation, which is the Israel of God, which are all believers, Jews and Gentiles, that are in Jesus Christ. And so this second woman that is being taken by Hosea as a wife represents the fact that, that you know, uh, you know, there will be a new uh, body that Jesus Christ will take upon to himself, which would be that spiritual nation of Israel. So again, we see those parallels there being played out. The physical nation rejected and a spiritual nation being taken uh, to rule and reign with Christ in his millennial reign. All right. So that's, that's how uh, you know, um, those chapters conclude, chapters 1 and chapter 2. And again, chapter 3 has a very similar uh, parallel message as well. If you can please turn to Matthew 21 for me. Turn to Matthew 21 and verse number 43. Turn to Matthew 21 and verse number 43. And I know, you know, as a church, you guys are very, very familiar with this teaching. But, you know, because we live in this day and age and we live in so many, amongst so many believers and, and brethren that I'm friends with that have such an unusual idea of, you know, um, God bringing back that physical nation. You know, we need to cover this over and over again. So in Matthew 21, verse 43, it says, Therefore say I unto you, these are the words of Jesus, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. So God here is speaking to the Jews that do not believe on him. He says, look, the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from you and given to another nation. All right, a nation that brings forth the fruits thereof. Look at verse number 44. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, and on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard this par these, this par his parables, look at this, they perceived that he spake of them. Yeah, why did he speak of them? Because they rejected Jesus Christ. Because they had a false religion that they were following. Hey, that's just exactly what was going on with the nation of Israel in the time of Hosea. They had rejected God. They've gone after false gods, after false religions. And so that was about them. They would be rejected and God would receive unto himself a, another nation. Okay. Now, go back to Hosea for me. Go to Hosea and go to chapter 2. Hosea chapter 2. And look at verse number 23. Hosea chapter 2 and verse number 23. You look at that and I'm going to read to you from 1 Peter chapter 2 verse number 9. Okay, just so you can see the similar words. I'm reading to you from 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9. It says, But ye are a chosen generation, speaking to believers, all believers, Jew and Gentiles in Christ, a royal priesthood and holy nation. Hey, that's the nation that God has given the kingdom to. All right? And holy nation are peculiar people 
that ye should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now compare Hosea 2.23 with what I'm about to read. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So what does Hosea 2.23 say? And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say unto them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. Okay, so this second woman that Hosea is marrying was not his wife, right? Was not his people, as it were. In fact, she belonged to another man. She had become a widow, but now he took her to himself. And this represents the fact that we were once not the people of God, but we've become his people. Okay, so the parallels are just too... What's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> they're, they're too uh, perfect, right? They're too perfect to, to sort of take some other position. I don't, I don't think any other position really does justice to Hosea chapter 3 as much as this position does. You know, now you say, well, Pastor Kevin, does that mean we have to uh, break fellowship with those that might have a different position on Hosea and his marriages? Absolutely. No, I'm just joking. Of course not. Okay? <laughs> you know, these, these, are, these are chapters that are quite challenging. These are chapters that... Uh, do ask a lot of questions and you know it requires a lot of study so you know when, whenever we have passages where you know there are different views and it, it's usually because these they are challenging passages right they, it really requires you to get digging deep and know the bible well so of course you wouldn't break fellowship with people that you know view these passages in a different light okay but but i love i love the consistency in hosea chapter one chapter two and chapter three now, let's go back to Hosea chapter 3. Let's keep going in verse number 3. Hosea chapter 3 and verse number 3. It says, And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot. So this is the woman that he's uh, marrying. And thou shalt not be for another man. So will I also be for thee. So I want you to think about it. What, what is Hosea saying? He says, look, and thou shalt not be for another man, so will I also be for thee. That sounds again a lot like Hosea chapter 2 verse 23, where it said, And I will say unto them, which were not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say, thou art my God. Okay, Hosea is basically saying the same thing. You know, you're my wife, don't go and play the harlot, and I am, for, I am yours. You know, you belong to me, and I belong to you. Okay, so again, you can see how these things align. Let's go to verse number four. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king and without a prince and without a sacrifice and without an image and without an ephod and without teraphim. Now, let's break down verse number four and then we can tie it into verse number three there. So there's a prophecy here of Hosea that he's saying, look, there's coming a day when, when the nation of Israel, the physical nation there, will have no king. Now look, Today, Israel has no earthly king, right? The, the physical nation. And we know that when Israel was taken uh, by the Assyrians, that they, that's it, that was the end for their, for, uh, of their kingship, right? That was the end of it. So from, from that time till even to this day, they still have no king. And then it says, and without a prince. So a prince would be someone that follows after. So if the king passes away, the prince would become the king. So there's no, you know, uh, dynasty. There's no lineage of kings that would continue and again we live in that day and without a sacrifice so there's coming a day when they're going to stop giving those sacrifices in the temple right again that's today they're not offering sacrifices there's been an end to that again because the new testament is in effect jesus christ is the sacrifice um and without an image i'll get to the image in a minute and then it says and without an ephod so an ephod was again the what was required for the priest to wear and uh, again, so it's saying basically there will be no Levitical priesthood. Again, here in 2020, there is no Levitical priesthood. And, th you know, that whole practice was done away with when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. So we're definitely, you know, Hosea is definitely speaking about a future event to come. Now, all these things that I just mentioned to you do have to do with Old Testament worship. Do have to do with the things that God asked this nation to do in service for him. But it's also tied in with the worship that they, that they were doing to false gods. Because it says there, in verse number 4, and without an image. 
So this is basically talking about an idol. Again, remember they set up statues and they had all these, you know, statues of gold and of wood they would they would worship. And so what they were doing was that they were mixing the worship of God with pagan worship, with worship of false gods. They were mixing the two things together. It reminds me of a lot of the Roman Catholic Church, where you know a lot of what they say sounds Christian, right? But then, you know, their practices, the, all their statues and images, how they pray to these saints, that's all pagan worship. That's all worshiping false gods, right? So it's like they've, they've mixed Christianity with false religion. And basically, that is what's happened in the time of Israel as Hosea was ministering to them by preaching the word of God. And so then it says, uh, we are an ephod, and look at the end, and without teraphim. Now, I don't know exactly what teraphim is, but I did a word study through the, through, the, through the Bible, and every time the word teraphim is mentioned, it's tied in together with idols and, and false gods. So again, this is something else that is uh, not what God required from this. This is something else that's corrupting the worship of God. All right. So what is Hosea saying? He's saying, look, he's saying to his wife that he's taken, hey, you belong to me, I belong to you for many days. Will it say there? Yeah, thou shalt abide for me, uh, thou shalt abide for me many days. We're going to be together for many days. And then in verse number four, for the children of Israel shall abide many days without king and so forth. So there are going to be many days ahead, which is roughly, oh, I don't know, you know, over 2,000 years now, right? Where, where, the, where the, the, new, the northern kingdom of Israel would not be worshipping God with all these corrupted, you know, false gods. That's going to put, be put in, there's going to be an end to all of that for many days. But also during those many days, Hosea will be with his wife. Okay, so think about that. So if God has a spiritual nation, so why, why we have that physical nation no longer practicing their religion or even their false religion, but what is happening are the true worshippers of God. Hey, we can worship God in spirit and in truth, and we are together with Jesus Christ, right? Uh, Jesus says that he will never leave us nor forsake us. You know, we're with Jesus Christ with for many days, as it is in fact we're with Jesus Christ for all eternity. All right, so that's the, that's the parallel that we have there. Again, the woman representing, the second wife representing the spiritual nation of God that we're all part of. Now, I'm just going to read to you from 2 Corinthians 6.15. You don't need to turn there. I'll just read it to you. 2 Corinthians 6.15. And what concord have Christ with Belial? Or what part have he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement have the temple of God with idols? Hey, that's what Israel was doing. They were mixing the temple of God with idol worship. For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Again, quoting what Hosea said, you know, in, in chapters, sorry, in uh, Hosea chapter 2. All right, so you can see once again that God is looking back to the way that the Old, um, Old Testament nation of Israel was mingling God's worship with false gods. God says, look, what concord have, have I with Belial? You know, what, what agreement is there, you know, between, uh, you know, worshipping God and following after these false gods? You know, we are called to be followers of the Lord. We are actually the temple of God. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. And so we are, you know, saved for the purpose of giving God worship, giving God service. Okay? For all eternity, brethren. Not to go and worship some false gods and get into false religion. We are called to get out of that and be worshippers of the God of the Bible we are his people and he is our God. Okay, back to Hosea. Oh, you're already there. Hosea chapter 3 and verse number 5. It says, Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Once again, how does Hosea chapter 3 finish? The same way that Hosea chapter 1 finished, the same way that Hosea chapter 2 finished, the millennial reign of Christ. Again, we are the Israel of God. God has started focusing on the physical nation that's been rejected, but now he's receiving unto himself the spiritual nation of all believers, Jews and Gentiles, in Jesus Christ. And one day we're going to have David as our king. Now that David there is referring to Jesus Christ. 
because Jesus Christ would come from David, right? You know, when Jesus walked the earth, they, they, uh, they said of him that he's the son of David, right? He was a descendant of King David. Now, I'm going to read to you. Actually, let's, let's finish up here. You go to John chapter 10. You go to John chapter 10 for me. And I'm going to read to you from Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37 verse 22. You go to John chapter 10. Ezekiel 37 22 reads, And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. Now we saw in Hosea that king was called David, right? So there'll be one nation and one king. Then it says, and they shall be no more two nations. Again, the fact that there was a northern kingdom of Israel and a southern kingdom of Judah, that distinction won't exist in the millennial reign of Christ. Then it says, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their destitute, uh, des sorry, nor with their des des detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them. So shall be my people and I will be their God. Again, the same wording that Hosea used, the same wording that um, uh, Peter used, right? And referring to the spiritual nation of God. And then it says in verse number 24, and David, my servant, so there's David again, shall be king over them now, this is why this is not actually King David, but Jesus Christ, okay? And then it says, And they shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. All right? So the millennial, millennial reign of Christ is going to be exciting. The whole world is going to be following the commandments of God. All right? Now, you're in John chapter 10, verse number 16. Who is that one shepherd? Who is that one king that was spoken about in Ezekiel? And of course, Hosea is speaking about. John chapter 10, verse 16 reads, words of Jesus Christ, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Right? So what we saw in Ezekiel, there'll be one nation and one shepherd. Hey, that one shepherd is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to sit on the throne of David. All right, now I'm sure King David's going to have a very prominent position uh, during that time, during the millennial, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ as well. But the one that, the person that is above all kings, the one that is the shepherd of the fold, of course, is Jesus Christ. And so, brethren, I hope that gives you further understanding of Hosea chapter 3. Listen, it is no different to Hosea chapter 2 and Hosea chapter 1. All this to serve us as an introduction for the rest of the book. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you uh, for this Bible study. Lord, thank you for helping me to work through the Bible and to be able to teach your word to New Life Baptist Church. Lord, I just pray that we would uh, understand, Lord, our calling as the spiritual nation of God, as the, as the Israel of God, that we are called to be his people and that he is our God. Lord, thank you so much for including us in, in your plans. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the, for the shepherd of the sheep. And Lord, he is the great shepherd, Lord. And uh, I thank you, Lord, that we can be under his protection and he can lead us in green pastures. Lord, I pray that we would be people that would walk in your ways. Lord, help us not to corrupt ourselves like the Israelites of old corrupted themselves, uh, Lord, with false worship. And Lord, I pray that we would always be people that uh, worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, thank you for the great teachings that we see in Hosea, Lord, the, the replacement theology that Hosea preached many, many years ago. We thank you, Lord, for the Bible. And Lord, I just pray that you'd bless us for the rest of the day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.